Production Committee asked me to, to speak. It's a great opportunity and the Bird Festival is so much fun and I miss it. I miss going out with our group and uh, enjoying the spring, but we'll try and recreate something of that, capture a little bit of it on this webinar. So I'm going to specifically talk about marine mammals of Point Reyes, and I won't talk about birds, which we would if we were out in the field, but uh, here we go, there. Uh, I will talk about first marine ecology and marine mammals generally, and then I'll talk about what species occur at Point Reyes that you're likely to see. And I'll drill down in more detail for some of the species which are more common and then some of the rare ones less so, but there are still opportunities to see them out at the headlands. And then finally, I'll talk about marine conservation, which EAC is so important in advancing in the MPA program and in, in other ways. So this is our outline and let's leap into it. So first, we're gonna drive out to the headlands and I know some of you have already been there, especially you docents, but this is the sort of day it would be. It would be spring, the lupin will be lush and fragrant, knock us over. There wouldn't be the wind that we have today, which is howling. It would be still, flat seas, we'd see everything because we'd be able to see the blows of the whales and it would be a perfect day out there and we'd be driving along the ridge here going out. And then we'd come to the visitor center, which is new, it's really exciting space. And in that space, you can learn about the marine system. You can learn about Cordell Bank Marine Sanctuary, National Marine Sanctuary, which helped put this visitor center together. And if you haven't been there, I highly recommend it. And it really does drill down in the ecology of the marine protected areas and the marine areas offshore of Point Reyes. And this is where I'll spend a little extra time talking to you about the coastal upwelling ecosystems of the world, but specifically of the California current, which is the one that is along our coastline here. And this is what it looks like. So the combination of the California current and wind-driven currents, which occur this time of year with the howling winds, we have incredible upwelling and that upwelling is the basis of the food web that we have in Central California and the little red circle shows you where we are in this incredible upwelled area. So the combination of the California current along the coast here and this wind driven upwelling create the basis of the food web. And great blooming algae is the food upon which the krill feed on and the krill is the basis of the food web really in our marine mammal system. And so there are 45 different species of marine mammals that you can see off of Point Reyes, it's incredible. I haven't seen all of them off Point Reyes, but I have seen them throughout California. And there are eco-regions that go by bioregion north and south. So by latitude, north and south and by onshore, offshore. So you have different ecosystems associated with these different areas of the coastline and different species associated with those ecosystems. So in nearshore, you would have gray whales and, and dolphins and you'd have harbor seals using the kelp beds. And then offshore, this is supposed to be the Farallon Islands, you would have humpback whales, elephant seals, these are Rizos dolphins, which we don't see very often at Point Reyes, but sometimes. And something like this, which is called a sunfish, which we do see off of Point Reyes, pretty exciting. And marine mammals exploit this, these habitats. They don't just live there, they thrive. <clears throat> and they thrive, thrive because they have evolved different morphology and physiology to enable them to to eke out a living in these very extreme environments. They streamlined, got a streamlined body shape, so their nose is on top of their head. For whales, when they surface, they breathe through their, their blowholes. <clears throat> they have modified appendages like sea lions for swimming through whale with wings as their flippers. And the modified feeding forms, such as baleen, which is so different than, than other forms of feeding um, with one's mouth. And then they have unique ways to keep their core body temperature warm when they dive deep and are in cold waters and immersed 
continuously in cold waters. How do you do that? You have incredible blubber layers or fur like sea otters. And then they have unique ways to, to live in the deepest ocean, to hold their breasts for long periods of time. So I could spend hours just talking about their physiology and morphology, but just think of the range of pressures that they're under in these different environments and the extremes that you would see in these different environments. So you might have extreme uh, types of, of dives and things like that. Uh, marine mammals fall into three different taxonomic orders. They don't all fit into one order. So those three orders include cetaceans, which are the whales, the baleen whales, and the toothed whales. Here's a, a right whale. We're not likely to see that very often at Point Ray Settlements, but you might. You might, there are only 17 left of the North Pacific right whales, but you might see one. Um, and then tooth whales, uh, increasingly, orcas are seen off of Point Reyes headlands. And then there are the carnivores, which include the pinnipeds, uh, the seals and sea lions, and the mustelids, which are the otters, and river otters and sea otters. And I include river otters, and I'll explain that in a little bit, but it's important to recognize that they exploit the marine system in some ways more so at Point Reyes than sea otters, which are pretty rare. And then the Sirenians, which used to be here, but are no longer here. Um, and so that's something maybe that could be reintroduced. You never know when, when habitats are restored, different species arrive on their own or, or are brought here. So, to live in these extreme environments, you see some of the most extreme things in marine mammals, like the largest animal on Earth, which is the blue whale. In fact, there was a scientific paper recently out explaining why you could have such large animals in the ocean. And, and yet, they can't be too large, or they would not be able uh, to keep that core body temperature. So there's a physiology, morphology, dynamic that en enables them to be so large. And then there's the oldest mammals. Bowhead whales are thought to be over 200 years old. And bowhead whales are not here, but right northern right whales are an example of that. And then the thickest fur of any mammal would be the sea otter, one million hairs per square inch. There is no fur thicker than that, and that's why they were hunted so intensively. And then the longest migration. This is a record now held by gray whales and humpback whales, and no doubt will be broken by other, other whales, perhaps by a blue whale or sperm whales, because we are starting to get the technology that we can attach to these animals and track their movements incredible distances. And I'll show you an example of track recently. And then the deepest divers of all animals. And right now the records are held by sperm whales and beaked whales. There may be deeper divers, but think about the Mariana Trench and how deep that it is, 35,000 feet, and what, what animals might exploit that deep trench. So that's pretty exciting to think about. And there's so much that we don't know about the oceans and especially the deepest oceans. We know more about the surface of Mars with the Mars uh, robot than we do about the deepest oceans. So more, more opportunity for research and learning. So that deals with the ecology and marine mammals generally. And now I'm going to switch to point rays and what species you're likely to see out here. And I want, to th want you to imagine that you're out at the lighthouse. You've just been up at the platform and you've looked out. And again, it's a beautiful, calm day. You could see any blow, blow as far as the eye could see. And you're walking down the stairs looking, looking for that gray whale, which is probably migrating north right now. Uh, but you could also see blue whales or humpback whales. Um, but first, we'll talk about the baleen whales that you might see. And remember, baleen whales do not have teeth. They have baleen instead, which is a car it's not, there's not a tooth material. It's cartilage type material. So that's a unique feeding behavior. And I'll show you a picture of it uh, briefly. They also have two blowholes, which is different from the other cetaceans. So they, 
you'll see in this case uh, for a gray whale, a blow, a heart-shaped blow. There are these three families and gray whales are in their own family. They're so unique. And then they, the Balanopteridae have blue whales, humpback whales, minke whales, and the others. So we'll talk about these as potentially ones you might see. So again, the baleen whales, look at how sleek this blue whale looks, incredibly sleek. But when its mouth is full up, it, it has throat pleats that expand, so they look kind of like a tadpole. It's really an incredible transformation, and in some whales, these pleats extend all the way practically to the belly button. And now with drones, this is the sort of photography that's possible to see how they feed. So here's a blue whale feeding on krill, sucking it all up as it's along the surface with just its flipper exposed and part of his head. Pretty, whoa, something happened there. So here we go, how's that? Back on track. So here we go. This is what a blue whale looks like from their back. Just a teeny little dorsal fin, but you might see this at Point Reyes Headlands. I have seen them there. Look at this mottled surface, but the back extends forever in this ridiculous little dorsal fin. Again, the largest animal on earth, but their baleen is not very large because they feed mostly on fish and krill. And here's an example of size comparison. Here is uh, uh, one of the way boats that go out uh, for uh, party boats. It's probably about 50 feet long and look at this whale in comparison. This could be at Point Reyes. I don't believe this was taken in Monterey Bay, but again, look at the length and sleekness of that blue whale. You cannot mix it up with any other animal. And there's that long back again. And here's a common mer for comparison of size. Amazing. So there are population estimates that are derived by NOAA for many of these whales. I'm not going to talk about all of the population estimates, but I want you to, to see this for a blue whale. And what they do is they do cruises up and down the coast of California. Again, the red circle is where we are. And you can see where there are concentrations of blue dots. Those are the sightings. And there are a lot of sightings off of our area. And so this is the estimate for this California, Oregon, Washington population of, of blue whales. Not huge, but not small. And here is an example of a satellite tagged uh, blue whales. And here's one green marked one, Gulf of the Farallons, hanging out a lot there. This is one whale that goes between off of Central America and then up off of, um, off of Central California. So there's an idea of their range for this one population. Incredible. And of course, we've had blue whales wash ashore here. This is one that was uh, necropsied by Cal Academy of Sciences in Bolinas. And I don't know, maybe some of you listening to this participated in that necropsy, but this is actually a person on, on top of this dead whale. And it was a ship strike that killed this whale. But there's an example. They're here. We know they're here. The next largest is a fin whale. And it's called the greyhound of the sea because they are so fast. I have seen a fin whale right below the lighthouse. They have a very distinct bicoloration of their jaw. You can see dark on this side and light on the other. Then they eat mostly fish. Um, you may not see them, but there's always the possibility. And then humpback whales, which I see all the time off of Point Race Headlands. And this is an example of why it's called a humpback whale, because of that arched back. They are distinguished by their long wing-like flippers, and I'll show you that in a second. But they're called the ballerinas of the sea because they can turn so quickly um, as they're chasing their prey and concentrating their prey. They are one of the single longest migrators. There was one individual that traveled from Costa Rica all the way to Antarctica and back, and right now that's the record being held. They're true singing whales, and they repeat the song every half hour, and every stock has a different song. This is what allows these whales to turn so quickly, these tubercles. They're, they're 
nodules along the leading edge of the long flipper. And it allows them to turn very quickly. And recent research has also shown, again, by, because of drone um, kept capturing the imagery of them using the flipper for herding the krill or fish towards their mouths. Incredible. So this is an amazing species. And in one day, I've seen nearly 50 off of Point Race headlands as they were feeding on a flat calm day. There's so many now in our area, they were seen as invading San Francisco Bay in 2016. And here, this picture is taken by a friend of mine, Bill Keener. He's on the Golden Gate Bridge, and here are three humpback whales swimming underneath the bridge. Here they are feeding underneath the, the bridge. Amazing. And this has been happening again almost every year. And they're not getting hit by ships when they're in the bay. It's very interesting of what I've heard. And one time I watched while they were feeding in the bay and when a big tanker came in, they all went to the side of the bay as the tanker went through. So there's more to this story about ship strikes and what happens and how we can protect them. Minky whales, they're the smallest of the baleen whales. They're only 25 feet, but they're, they're around year round in our area. I've seen them every month of the year in Drake's Bay. And they're very unusual to see though, because they're, they're not dramatic on the surface. This is a dramatic photo of one breaching. One way to distinguish them is they have this little chevron on the side of their, their flipper. Um, but they're hard to see. They have a falcate uh, dorsal fin, which means rounded. I've seen them at the mouth of Tamales Bay, and I've seen them often to Drake's Bay. And just keep your eyes out. Uh, Sue Vanderwall, who's a photographer, and many of you know her, she actually saw a calf um, and helped rescue one that was ashore. So they're here. But the one you're going to see, just like humpback whales a lot, are gray whales. And this also is one of the longest migrators. Uh, they have short baleen, no dorsal fin. This is what makes them very different. No dorsal fin here. They have very short baleen. It's probably a foot at the most. And that's because they feed uniquely. They're mud suckers. And so they're sucking the mud and all the organisms that are in the mud and then using their tongue to push the mud out in the water. They don't have pleats. They have grooves. They have three grooves in their throat. So that is sucking and not engulfing with a big gulp, like you'll see with the other baleen whales. And this is their migration pattern north, southbound, and northbound. And right now we're in the northbound phase right here. This is Mother's Day. I've seen many gray whales with their calves in Drake's Bay. So that's what we're looking forward to if we're able to go to the beach next week. And their population is also increasing and doing well. So these data are from the American Cetacean Society and they, they count them all along the coast. And it's not a perfect number for the population estimate. Last year was estimated 25,000, the highest count ever. Okay, and here's a mother and calf. They're now calfing in Monterey Bay, this calf this year was likely born in Monterey Bay. So that's, that is an, an example of their population increasing and we're benefiting from that. Okay, so switching now to tooth whales, teeth, not baling. They have one blowhole, not two, and they have what is called biosonar, which they use to echolocate. So baling whales do not echolocate. It doesn't mean they can't hear underwater, but they do not produce a sound that goes out and comes back. So uh, previous. So the sound is generated here. They detect something and then it bounces back and their lower jaw picks up the sound and the information is transmitted to the ear and then to the brain. So a bottlenose dolphin can detect a pin at 360 feet. And they've done that in the lab. That's why they know. A sperm whale is thought to have detected sound from 10 miles away using biosonar. So incredible. So here those 
teeth, incredible teeth. And the largest of the toothed whales is, is the sperm whale. They do occur out here. Calves have been found out here. We do not have a clue how they use their habitat or where they go. They're the deepest divers likely, but we can only imagine what they're doing and where they are. They're the most strange looking with this big, big round square head. They have a lot of teeth, but a tiny little mouth, uh, throat. So they're sucking their prey in and a big part of their prey is humble squid. Uh, so more to be learned in the future about sperm whales and they can be seen at point rays. Switching now to orcas, which are present and increasingly so. And what's amazing about them is females have been logged to be over a hundred years old. They have a matrilineal society, but these females actually go into menopause when they're about 40. So they carry the culture and they're sharing that culture with the offspring and the various generations, they help raise younger ones. They're incredibly social. So, so here are the key markings uh, for that. Okay, so what we have with orcas are three actual ecotypes that occur in our area and three ecotypes associated with the California current. These may become different species but right now, um, right now, they're, they're defined as ecotype. And they fall into the southern resident, the transient, and the offshore. And morphologically, they're all slightly different. You can see here the dorsal fin is taller with the southern resident. Uh, so morphologically, they're different. But also, uh, they eat different things. So with the, their, with the transients, they eat marine mammals primarily. With the southern residents, they eat mostly salmon, Chinook salmon in particular. And then the offshore, we know they eat sharks, but we don't know as much about them. And all three ecotypes have occurred at Point Reyes. On Thanksgiving in 2011, there was an offshore um, specimen that came in, a, a whale that was identified to, as an in individual found by Joel Sewell and at Tamales Point and is now a skeleton at Cal Academy. And then there was um, one that came in and cited by Carlo, um, the K and L pods of the Southern residents. And he, we could identify the, the pods because of the dorsal fins of, from his photographs. And then recently there were the transients that were seen. Um, this was identified uh, by Dave Elephant uh, from from his photo records of one of the ones photographed by one of the docents photographs. So maybe one of you on this, this webinar actually did this photograph. Photographs do help for identification, so thank you. And then finally, the small cetaceans, there are a whole suite of these that could be off of point rays. I'm not going to go through all of them, but I will explain the dolphins and porpoises are different and the dolphins have a beak, if the beak is not, in this case, for Pacific white-sided, not much of a beak, um, but they, their teeth are conical, like your dogs. Um, porpoises have a rounder head, and they're two species, so you were not gonna have any trouble finding, identifying them, they're only the two species. You're unlikely to see their teeth up close unless they're dead on the beach. But luckily, there are only two species to identify here, harbor porpoise and doll's porpoise I'll talk about in just a second. First, um, one that you're most likely to see are bottlenose dolphins. And this population is estimated to be about 500 now uh, along California. And they have extended their range now all the way up to Mendocino. And they're pretty amazing individuals. Um, they individually identify themselves by a signature whistle. And in fact, there was a study done recently where a, a female was whistling to her calf while it was still in her uterus. And when she gave birth, then she was identified her new calf with this, its own signature whistle. So that's how they, they're passed on these signature whistles by the adult to the calf. It's incredible. More, more will be learned about that. So again, 
for porpoises, there are only two. The smallest in the California current is the harbor porpoise. And you do see these regularly in Drake's Bay, but they, they just blip on the surface. And again, my friend Bill Keener has this study on the Golden Gate Bridge, and he has identified all sorts of harbor porpoises from their photo images, so he knows individuals. And here's a, a female with a calf, and here's a different one with a calf. And so he's gotten amazing um, information by identifying individuals over time, and he's identified individuals between locations, not just at the Golden Gate. So they, they're very shy animals, but they're abundant and their population seems to be increasing. So keep your eyes out open for harbor porpoise. I often see them on the edges of feeding flocks where there are lots of birds feeding. Um, so keep your eyes open for that. And then switching from cetaceans to physipeds, uh, we have the sea otters and the river otters. And the sea otters are really rare, but here's a photo of one in Drake's Estero, tied up in the kelp beds of Drake's Estero. So they, sh they show up here regularly, but they're not resident. River otters, on the other hand, are incredibly resident. Uh, they've got dens. They weren't here 25 years ago, but now they're absolutely here. Um, and you can see them in any marine habitat. And I include them in marine mammals because they feed on marine organisms. And you'll often see them in Drake's Bay because there's a den out there uh, up one of the drainages. So they have dens and that's where they raise litters. Whereas sea otters only have one pup and they raise it in the water. That's a huge difference. So here's a litter of, of river otters. And if you don't believe me, Carlos Parado's picture caught one and feeding on, um, I believe it's a skate. Uh, and he photographed this in Drake's Bay. If you want to learn more about it, go to riverotterecology.org and they have an otter spotter program where you can see where they're seen throughout the San Francisco Bay Area. So an incredible species uh, that is a marine mammal. So now we're going to switch gears and we're going to go to Sea Lion Overlook. And for those who have not been there, you're, here's the lighthouse over here and you're driving back along the road and here's a little section of pullout called Sea Lion Overlook. Nobody stops there. It's great, it's quiet, it's out of the wind. And this is what you look down below you are the sea lions hauled out on these rocks or on these offshore rocks here. And it's a wonderful place to just sit and have lunch. So we would do that if we were together right now. So here's the overlook right there, a quiet spot. And we'll talk about pinnipeds there. And pinnipeds are so different from the others. They're carnivores and they fall into two families, odorides, the eared seals, and the phocid, or earless seals. And pinnipeds are unique in that they come on shore to give birth and, and spend some time to rest on land or, or even to breed or to molt on land, but they're tied to the land, but they make their living in the ocean. Uh, so that's what makes them different as a marine mammal. They, and in the San Francisco Bay Area, there are several places where they haul out, <coughs> but the three important colonies in the Bay Area are the Farallon Islands, on Nuevo, and Point Race Headlands, where you get huge concentrations of several species. So that's another reason why Point Race Headlands is so unique. San Francisco Bay has its own group of pinnipeds that haul out on the floats off of Pier 39. <coughs> it's a great place to see sea lions um, and they're there year round, but I wouldn't call it their best habitat. So for sea lions uh, and fur seals, there are four species that, that occur here. And remember, these are the sea lions, uh, the odorides that can rotate their pelvis. So that's why their butts are pulled underneath them. They have long front fore flippers and that's what they use for propelling themselves through the water. So these are their odorides, and there are four species that occur in the California current. And I'm only gonna talk about three of them because the Guadalupe fur seal is pretty rare, 
though it does show up on occasion. The first is the fur seal, the northern fur seal, and this is a really amazing animal that, that a lot of the Marine Mammal Protection Act laws were driven by this species because of their large breeding colonies up in Alaska and their, the fur trade associated with that in international agreements. And there's a big colony on the Channel Islands, but more recently, there's been a colony on the Farallon Islands, and that's why I bring this species up. They're sexually dimorphic. The males are so much bigger. Here's a male, and here's like a female size one. They're very gregarious on land, but you'll only see them groups of two or three offshore, and they breed right now. This is the time of year when they're breeding. And if you were on a boat and you went out to the Farallon Islands, this is what you would see. Last year, so 2019, there were 540 pups, basically, on these rocks, and they're on these offshore rocks. 20 years ago, they weren't there. This is an incredible story of animals congregating on the Farallon Islands, a protected area, and reclaiming areas where they used to haul out. And there, this incredible growth of this colony, uh, they were hunted to extinction off of the Farallon Islands in the 1700s for the, by the fur trade. So having them back is great, and it's possible that they could extend their range to Point Reyes headlands, and a colony could be at Point Reyes in the future. Protected areas are important. Now I'm shifting to California sea lions. This is an animal that you're gonna see a lot at Point Reyes. Their numbers are about 300,000 in, in California and the males migrate north in the winter. They don't breed at Point Reyes Headlands, but they breed on the Farallons, and they're also, their numbers are increasing on the Farallon Islands in breeding. They're also very sexually dimorphic. Here's a male and a female, um, and they, they're they well known for their barking. So if you hear barking down below that, uh, below that cliff, and we're looking from sea lion overlook, that would be California sea lions. And this is what a colony looks like on the Channel Islands, here's a male and a bunch of females around. And these are little pups that form little gathering groups because the females have to go to sea to feed. And then they come back to the beach to nurse their pups. And they'll, they'll nurse their pups for six months. Um, it's a really strong bond with mother and pup here. Now shifting to stellar sea lions. They used to breed at Point Reyes Headlands, but they stopped breeding there around in the 1970s. They still breed on the Farallon Islands and on Nuevo. And at Fort Ross, there's some rocks where they breed there. But they, they don't bark so much as they roar. So if you hear a roar, that's probably a male stellar sea lion. They're mostly non-migratory. They occur um, back and forth between the Farallons and Point Reyes Headlands, but they don't breed at Point Reyes Headlands anymore. This is what the colony looks like on the uh, Ana Nuevo, here's a bull. Look at that big mane. This is where the term lion came from for sea lions, that big mane and they're roaring. And incidentally, this is a California sea lion colony and here's the stellar sea lion colony. They're the largest of these odorides, the males up to 1500 pounds. So big, big and big and roar, really amazing animals and their range is shrinking. Um, their, their population in California is very, very healthy. Now we're shifting, uh, we're shifting to Elephant Seal Overlook. So we're driving down the road to the Chimney Rock parking lot, and then we hike out this trail, and we're gonna learn about phocid seals. That would be elephant seals, which are all along the beach here. We're looking from this overlook. Some of you have been docents there, um, and another beautiful calm day out there, and they're basking in the sun. This time of year, May, is, is when they're molting their fur. They're not breeding, but you'll see some really high numbers during the molt. I've counted over 2,000 elephant seals during the molt uh, throughout Point Race Headlands. So this is an important area for elephant seals. Um, so first we'll talk about, we'll talk about Harbor seals, they're year round residents. Um, the individuals will migrate uh, locally, but they're here at these haul out sites year round. And what's really different about them is this pups can swim at birth. None of the other species can swim at birth. The sea lions leave their pups and go out and feed. Harbor seals, if they feed, they take their pups with them. They're feeding 
elephant seal pups cannot, cannot swim until about 30 days. And their breeding season, March through June, little sexual dimorph dimorphism between the uh, males and females. And this is very different from the other species, from the odorides and even from the elephant seals. They're, as a friend of mine said, you can't tell the difference until they roll over or they drop their pants. Um, basically, uh, they're about the same size, uh, but you can tell a female but when she has a pup because she's lying on the side and nursing. Uh, but basically, they're about the same size. So here are all their colonies throughout this region. And this is an important concentration. 20% of the mainland breeding uh, harbor seals occur in Point Reyes. Really high numbers occur here. Uh, and one of the reasons is because there's this great estero, which is now a wilderness area, and all of these sandbars provide a perfect place for a female to raise her pups. Uh, so it's away from the mainland for the most part, and they can rest and nurse on shore without being harassed by predators or people. An incredible opportunity for them. And here's a picture by Carlos Parada where here they are on a sandbar, and usually they're a couple hundred. Now, there's been a predator in the, that's returned to Point Reyes, coyotes, and they're pressuring harbor seals in various populations. And so it's interesting to see when the coyotes can access these sandbars, the harbor seals move someplace else. Um, and so we're watching this, but it's once you have all your members of your ecosystem back in place, it's fun to see this dynamic that's happening of predators and prey and, and harbor seal pups are only 24 pounds. So they, they're prey item for a lot of large mammals larger mammals, but they can swim at birth and so they can escape into the water. Uh, so here's an example of a pup that's resting on shore and they can swim within hours of birth. Uh, so that's what makes them very different from the other pinnipeds. We've been monitoring these animals over time and these are an example of the numbers that we see at Point Race Headlands and they've been around the same over the past couple decades uh, for the adults and the pups. Uh, so it is about 1,200 pups born every year um, in Point Reyes. And here is a pup with a female that Sarah Cotty just took a couple days ago. One of the other things we monitor is disease in harbor seals. And uh, one, we documented three die-offs, but I wanted to highlight this. Normally I wouldn't have highlighted this, but one of the die-offs when we were able to get the samples from Tomales Point was identified as coronavirus. So coronavirus is not, is not new in, in, uh, as, a, as a virus amongst animals and caused a rapid severe die-off of harbor seals in this small colony at Tomales Point in the year 2000 uh, that we were able to document. So I thought that would be interesting to you. And there's the paper associated with that if you, you would like to see it. And then finally, I'm shifting to northern elephant seals. And what's amazing about them is they spend most of their life at sea. That's most of their life, 85% of their life at sea. But also of that life at sea, they're underwater. They're not, they're underwater. So they're holding their breath up to two hours maximum, but regularly up to an hour. And they're diving deep. They're diving more than 5,000 feet, and regularly they're diving 1,000 feet, and they're diving continuously. We know this from the research that was conducted at Santa Cruz, where they, they put transmitters, receivers, and, and satellite uh, data loggers on these animals and tracked their movements, where they were foraging, how deep they were diving, incredible research that we've all benefited from. And they we're not quite sure what they're feeding on, but Another paper that just came out last year identified lantern fish is a big part of their diet, but it, they're feeding mostly on bottom fish, things that you don't put on your plate because they're not competing with fishermen um, for things that we bring in um, into shore to eat. So right now they're not competing with, with uh, commercial fishermen uh, for their food. The males can fast up to three months during the breeding season. 
um, but really remarkable life. And here's an example of the extreme sexual dimorphism of elephant seals. There's a bull, and this is why he's called an elephant seal because of that big snout that they use for trumpeting. And this is cornified skin that protects their, their chest when they're fighting. And here's a female, about a thousand pounds. The males can be up to 5,000, but the female's about a thousand pounds. And this is about a weaned pup, about to wean 300 pounds. So they're born 70 pounds, wean 300 pounds, that's more than a harbor seal. So this is a bigger than a harbor seal to give you an idea of size. Um, comparisons. So they don't breed in the spring and summer, they breed in the winter time and that's why Point Reyes is pretty exciting in the winter time um, and they breed also on the Farallons and on the Nuevo but the Point Reyes colony is growing fast. This is where it started and I remember seeing 12, 12 pups in 1984 I think it was and I thought gosh this this is a lot of space it could fill up. Well, it filled up and it's spread and the colony has been growing enormously. Uh, so this graphic I think is, is important to show how they've extended their, where they forage. Um, they males forage up in Alaska and the females tend to forage out in the North Pacific. So they're thought to feed on different things. Um, but I want to emphasize again, that they spend 80 to 90% of their life at sea and they only come on shore two times a year, once to molt their fur and the other time is when they give birth. Uh, so that's their tie to the land and, and the rest of the time they're at sea. Uh, this graphic shows what month of the year and what's happening and so here we are, there's a juvenile molt and the adult female molt is going on. So you can go to a colony at Point Reyes any time of the year and you're most likely to see an elephant seal, but the, any individual is spending most of its life at sea and it'll come on shore to do a juvenile haul out or during the breeding season or during the molt. At different times you'll see them on shore. So this is what's happened with the California population at Point Reyes. Um, and it's been growing at some points exponentially, but now more recently about 2% per year. And this was the last count. I think it was about 1200 pups born uh, last year as it's ex expanding and the numbers are so hard high now, it's hard for us to track them as they're expanding. And Sarah Cotty is the pinniped coordinator and having fun tracking them. Um, this is what happens when they're expanding. They're using public spaces um, such as parking lots. Uh, this is the fish dock parking lot where the, up to 90 females have given birth. And this is the, the spot at Drake's Beach where males regularly haul out. They like to park in the parking spot. Uh, they snuggle up to propane tanks um, and they're using public spaces. Last year uh, got a lot of press because they invaded uh, Drake's Beach. Um, they went up the ramp to the visitor center and there were something like 70 females with pups that were uh, born and raised at Point Race Headlands. And who knows under this restricted time right now, how many might be at, at Drake's Beach in front of the visitor center because we can't, we can't survey them right now. So that's it for the individual species and how you can see them, where you can see them. And you can drill down in all sorts of information to, to find out more about them. But I wanna get you interested in them and interested enough to care about marine conservation and marine mammal conservation. And that's what EAC has been heavily involved in. I want to, to just briefly talk about marine conservation. And I won't go through this litany of why we should be conserving marine mammals. There are lots of reasons for these um, effects on them um, and their declines from over exploitation to habitat loss. But ship strikes are a more recent issue. And here's a fin whale that was, um, a fin whale that was struck by a ship off a of point raised and washed ashore. So, um, and these bones show you 
where the fracture occurred on the dorsal fin. And recently, these ship lanes have been established by the Coast Guard to avoid whales. And this was organizations such as the Marine Mammal Center and uh, EAC and other groups, the Marine Mammal Commission, to identify where whales were concentrating offshore from studies done by Point Blue Conservation and the Coast Guard changing the shipping lanes so that they would go through areas where there's less concentration. So you see this, here's the new shipping lanes. And it has helped to reduce, but it has not eliminated because the whales forage in different areas, um, but the concentration of foraging is in certain areas. So this is, this is evolving. And what I applaud the, the shipping companies is they're voluntarily um, changing their speeds and going slower so they have less of an impact on whales. They don't want to hit a, hit a whale. Um, and so this has been a benefit. But I think this shipping lane here is still a problem because I think whales that might be feeding in the Gulf here don't always hear the, the ships as they're coming down the coast and take that dog leg there. So these shipping lanes may be modified, but they're working now. They're helping. They're reducing the ship strikes. And the, and the number of humpback whales has really been reduced since this has gone in place. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on climate change, but I, this is, uh, has a real effect that we're starting to see on marine mammals. But there's a lot of uncertainty about the effects because we don't know how the ocean is going to change. Uh, we don't know if El Nino events are going to increase or become more intense. That's what's predicted, and that would have a big effect on the California current. We don't know how ocean acidification would affect the prey, like krill or copepods or the organisms that gray whales suck up in the mud. Uh, so there's a lot of uncertainty here, and we'll study and, and find out. But what's most important is, is our efforts to preserve what we have and expand. And part of that is expanding on our conservation ethic. It's getting people to understand what's there. And I hark back to Captain Scammon because he was a whaler. And then he became an ardent, ardent naturalist and he preserved Scammon's Lagoon because that's where the gray whales were calved. And he made a, a huge effort to protect that. And that's why we have gray whales. And these marine protected areas, starting with Guadalupe Island and, and Scammon's Lagoon, and, and now in California, this large um, protected area program is really important uh, to preserve those refugia that where animals breed, feed, or gather. And Marine Mammal Protection Act, which is, it's up to its fifth, 50th year, uh, past this, just this 50th year celebrated, very important legislation uh, for protecting all marine mammals. But the best protection is through our science and education. And that ties back again with the AC and how important their MPA program is in educating the public about why marine protected areas are important, not just for marine mammals, but for all marine species and advancing, right now it's something like 18% of California is, is in marine protected areas, but most of that is not full protection. There are a lot of fisheries that occur. But as we learn more about the value of marine protected areas in California, we are gaining, um, we're, we're gaining people who are advancing it. Fishermen who used to um, poo-poo the value of marine protected areas, now see the value and they're fishing along the line. They see bigger fish, they see more fish near marine protected areas. So they're allies. We're all working together to make this marine system better. And I applaud EAC for being such a leader in that. So that concludes my uh, presentation and I would just thank you. I'll take questions now. Um, I do want to thank Sarah Cotty in particular, who's been important for the Pinniped Coordinator Program. And I also thank all of those people who've been sharing their uh, images with me uh, over the years uh, and call out in particular to Carlos and Sue Vanderwall and others, those who are docents like Sterling and see those great things. So thank you all.
So I'm sharing, I've stopped sharing, and now it's all you, Jess. Hey, big claps, silent uh, applause here for uh, Sarah Allen. I know you guys can all shout out your thanks, but I know you probably would want to because that was a fantastic presentation. I learned a lot and it reminded me a lot of being a ranger out of the lighthouse and seeing many of those species that you went over and there were some great refreshers there as well. See many so, <laughs> so I wanna remind you if you came in a little bit later that uh, you were joining us for Marine Mammals of Point Reyes with Dr. Sarah Allen. This is a Environmental Action Committee of West Marin Point Reyes birding and nature festival webinar. Woo, that was a mouthful. Um, and normally we have our festival at the end of April and Sarah is one of our many guides. Uh, we do have quite, we have a few guides on with us right now. Um, and I do wanna remind you uh, that you can check out information on the festival and we hope you can join us for the 50th anniversary um, in 2021 uh, next year to celebrate our 50th anniversary. Like uh, Sarah said, we have Marine Protected Area Program. Uh, it's a volunteer program. You can learn more at eacmarin.org and we're doing a lot of climate change work. So uh, it's a great time to get involved in the organization. Um, um, and learn about other webinars that we may have coming up in the future, not directly related to the festival, but maybe directed more towards our work. Um, and with that said, I wanna tell you and remind you that we do have the Q&A, so please leave a question if you have one. And I'm gonna just jump into a couple questions right here. Um, and this is a two-parter, so I'll start with part of it and then I'll ask you the other part. But this is in regards to sea otters, which is always a fantastic, yeah topic because people either are like no you didn't see that they don't happen here um but we have a question like how often do you see them and have they decreased over the last 30 years or not someone's anecdotal observation is that they are seeing them less regularly in the last 10 years or so could be coincidence or not and then he also assumes that he's seeing young males is that your observation yes yes well it is likely young males because they're the ones that range further uh, from their home range. Their home range right now is defined for sea otters. Their home range is defined around Monterey Bay, extending down to Pismo Beach almost and, and up to Half Moon Bay. So that's like the northern edge is Half Moon Bay and the current population estimates about 3,000, which has been about the same. It hasn't changed much in a number of years. Um, and they, they're talking about reintroducing them in other areas. So they're investigating potential relocation sites. Because the population is concentrated in one area, they're very vulnerable to an oil spill. Their fur is what keeps them alive. And so if they get oil fill, fur, then they can't survive. So uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service and the California Department of Fish and Wildlife together are starting to investigate other translocation areas. In fact, there was a paper recently that evaluated the, the value of San Francisco Bay. Came at, this paper just came out recently, last year. Uh, the value of San Francisco Bay is potential restoration habitat for, for sea otters. Uh, they were clearly there historically. They were hunted out and they were clearly along Point Reyes. And another site potentially is is in Point Reyes or, or North. So this is all evolving, but the numbers, I don't know that there have been less sightings. Uh, I still get sightings uh, that people tell me about. Uh, there was one in Tamales Bay hanging out a couple, three years ago. There was one at Point Reyes Headlands that was a rehab animal from uh, Monterey Bay um, and it, it had a tag and then they released it and it hung out at, in uh, Drake's Estero for about three months. A lot of people saw it at Lemon Tour. Um, so they're around and, and one was seen hauled out with elephant seals a couple years ago. So they're here, but they're not resident. And you're right, they're probably young males. Um, we're waiting for a female, a pregnant female, to, to come up here and discover it as a great place to hang out. I hope that answers your question. I think it does, and I think it actually tips into the next Next question, which is something that I was thinking is, I mean, be, they got hunted out a lot around here. I know they were further north 
health as well, but like they need those kelp beds, right? So the second part of that question was, um, what are the limiting factors for sea otters to expand their regular range to point rays in the Gulf of the Farallones? It seems like their northern expansion has been stalled for some time. Yes, yes, they're, well, they were uh, discouraged before, um, when they were translocated 20, uh, I think it was probably 40 years ago, maybe 30 years ago, they were translocated down to Southern California. So there's a little population down there. And some of the things they identified was kelp. Kelp was very important uh, to them because that's where they were discovered in a little kelp uh, forest in a remote area off of um, Big Sur. Uh, there were something like 30, 30 animals that were discovered there. And from that small population, it's expanded. But more recently, they realized that uh, otters really like estuaries. And they're in Elkhorn Slough. There's no kelp bed in Elkhorn Slough. They've got 100 uh, females with pups in Elkhorn Slough, and they're doing just fine. It's, it's the type of prey that's available for them, and that would be a limiting factor. Um, if they are outside in the outer coastal area, they do need kelp. And this big kelp die-off is worrisome that was experienced up in Sonoma County and a bit in Marin County. There's been some regrowth, um, but we're still in that in-between stage. So there's a, a program that NOAA and the state are involved in in, in trying to uh, promote growth of, of kelp forests in the areas of looking for refugia where they, or where they can also plant kelp and help it to advance. Um, but that's a whole nother uh, feel it, it takes time to to get ecosystems functioning and then the science to determine if it's actually working or not. But I think it was really interesting this discovery that they actually thrive in estuaries and that's why San Francisco Bay was looked at because they're not really in kelp beds except around the mouth in San Francisco Bay and yet there were thousands of otters in San Francisco Bay when they were hunted out. I hope that answers that, yeah. Great, okay, well, we're gonna move on to, since we're talking about seals, let's just keep that topic going. Um, we have a question, do you expect the population of northern elephant seals to keep increasing as a whole at Point Reyes? I assume at some point the population would level off. What factors would or are controlling their population size? That's a great question, and I don't know that we know what's going to limit their expansion at Point Reyes is because they're expanding in areas, frankly, I, I didn't quite expect. But it just, it goes to show that humans, the presence of humans in concentration on beaches is a deterrent because they didn't use Point, uh, Drake's Beach until there was the government shutdown in, in uh, 2017 or whenever that happened. Um, so all of a sudden people weren't on the beaches and the females came in and gave birth. Uh, so that was a big lesson on um, where they can expand and, and where they want to expand are areas where their pups are not gonna get washed out, out by big storms. So that, that we have cliff back beaches all along Drake's Bay, but we don't have big waves there. And if you'll notice on the ocean side of Point Reyes Peninsula, which extends, um, you know, from South Beach all the way up to Kehoe, that's not covered in elephant seals. And uh, we feel probably large waves um, are a deterrent. Um, a big carving out, we've got 20, 30 foot waves on that, those beaches that would carve out those beaches. So that might be a deterrent to them. And we're just learning more about their behaviors. They, they breed in the winter time, so it doesn't get too hot in the winter. However, uh, we've had 90 degrees in the winter in some areas. And at Drake's Beach, we found out, uh, Sericati studied them. The females will take their pups into the water. They actually take their pups, which can't swim very well, but they can swim a little. She takes them into the water and they'll to cool off. So that's a big way that they can deal with getting overheated um, because they have that big thick blubber layer they can get overheated. So that would be a deterrent for their using areas would be big waves maybe and too hot. Um, 
And, but we still have a lot of beaches at Point Reyes. So the population will probably continue to expand here. And in fact, new colonies are showing up north of here. There's a new colony in the Lost Coast of California, uh, about an hour's hike on the Lost Coast Trail and BLM Lane, a new colony there. There's a new colony in British Columbia. And we know from middens of Native Americans that elephant seals were, all, were breeding up in Washington state. So they're reclaiming uh, lost ground in some ways. Um, though if we had grizzly bears, that might be a deterrent. <laughs> Maybe that way back in the day we had those. Um, well, I think that answers someone else's where they thought if you, they might expand to lemon tour, which I would say, like you said, if the population increases, probably. But again, we saw drakes, which they were kind of coming that way. And every year there was like one, but once there was the shutdown, they were like, okay, I'm gonna take up this space. And actually, hopefully they're also loving it now. But this also comes into what I think of as, you know, respecting, Sometimes that park rules have to change, right? In order to help species. So we have to remember that while we recreate and while this is public space, we're also preserving this area for habitat for animals like this that are gonna expand. And sometimes we might lose access to some of our favorite places, at least for a part of the time. I think okay. the thing about elephant seals is that this is a large animal that you can get incredibly close to. Mm -hmm. And so, Sighting is a great opportunity for people to learn about the ocean with one species, an animal that dives deep. Think about what it's seeing at 5,000 feet. And so they're a great, I use them shamelessly to talk about marine conservation because they are so symbolic of so much about the marine system that's amazing. And so we want to encourage people to be excited about them without stepping on their flippers, so to speak. Right, and I think that's one of the great things of Point Reyes. Um, you know, Sarah Cotty is also with us today on this webinar, mm -hmm. who is the one that studies these and is studied with Sarah. Um, and so thank you for being here. Um, but I also think, you know, when we think about conservation, uh, we have to think about that it's changing, there's climate change, there's gonna be things that are gonna be changing up here in the near future. And we have to just be prepared for that. I've also seen in the park, you know, the visitor comes along um, occasionally and they think the little pup is uh, hurt and that needs it needs help because it's just so cute. Do you have any recommendations for folks if they're out, what to do if they think there's an injured marine mammal or something of concern? Do you encourage them to take the animal or do you offer some other advice? <laughs> That's an easy question. <laughs> you pick it up, right? <laughs> no, not, not. <laughs> so, so if you run across, and especially this time of year, those little harbor seals really are pick upable. You can't pick up an elephant seal pup, it's just way too heavy. Uh, but for a little harbor seal, and people pick them up all the time, it's best to leave them. And if you're worried about them, call up the park, um, Sarakati, or call up the Murray Mammal Center. And we have a, we'll have somebody go and check it out and see if it, it needs, intervention, but for the most part, we don't intervene because they're natural processes. Um, we're, we're allowing, this is a natural system and some animals die, not all. If every elephant seal survived that are born at Point Reyes, we would be buried in elephant seals. So some die every year and the rule, of, generally scientists believe that about 50% of what is born that year is lost because they haven't learned how to feed or predators or whatever. Sharks are all along Drake's Bay. Um, so they've got a lot to navigate to live that first year. Well, that's great. Um, oh, okay. sorry about that. I think we're going to move on from SEALs, but I do want to remind people, hey, if you have volunteer time and you want to get involved, there is a Harbor SEAL uh, docent program and an Elephant SEAL docent program and uh, very committed volunteers, especially those elephant seal docents that are out there with the public. They've been a tight knit community in the 20 years I've been here. And there's a, there's a couple of them on here, Jim, and also Sterling at least that I know. Um, and it's a great program to 
get involved in and you get lots of great training. Um, and then again, the Harbor Seals are a little bit more, or docents are a little bit more independent, but I encourage you to go to the Point Reyes National Seashore site and learn about those volunteer opportunities. Um, we, are, we do have a sea otter question uh, versus river otters. Do they compete? Uh, is that why sea otters haven't reestablished here? I think we've kind of gone over why they haven't reestablished here, but do the two species compete? That's a good question. They do overlap in the state of Washington. They do feed on similar things, but they use different habitats for the most part. Um, their sea otters prefer uh, eating things that they've got the big crushing jaw and teeth. So they can exploit food like clams and crabs that the river otters can't. Uh, so you might see river otters feeding mostly on fish or maybe small invertebrates or birds. They eat uh -huh. birds. Um, whereas sea otters would eat mostly um, clams and larger crabs or they'll eat some fish, but it's not a huge part of their diet. And they don't eat birds. They rarely eat birds. So there is overlap. They don't use the same terrestrial habitat because sea otters don't go on shore very often. Uh, but this will be interesting to see if they get established at uh, Point Reyes, where the overlap occurs and if there is competition. I will say sea otters are larger than river otters. So the size, if size matters, that could be an important factor. Uh, but they do coexist up in the state of Washington. Did you say sea otters are bigger than river otters? Yes. Wow. I totally had that backwards in my mind. That's good to know. I, we have a sea or this person has seen otters in the canal in Corta Madera that connects to the bay. Have you heard of, is it river otters and sea otters there? No, river, river otters in Corta Madera, but uh, one sea otter and a um, couple, three river otters were seen out at Point Reyes Headlands. I have a photograph. Uh, that was shared with me by Megan Isidore, and there clearly was a sea otter, and they were curious about him. I am assuming it was a him. <laughs> yeah, and once again, River Otter Ecology Project, uh, a partner of ours has great information about river otters. You should check out their website if you have more questions about that. I did miss one um, seal question, and that was, uh, what is the most current population of harbor seal? Do you know? The current estimate population is probably around 7,000 if you include the males and the females for point rays. Um, and um, I would think that last year, I can't, I'd have to defer to Saracati for the numbers, but generally it's been about 1,200 pups born per year. Uh, it's up and down depending on if it's an El Nino year or not, but uh, that's around about 1,200 pups per year. And, and the concentration of those pups is in Drake's Estero, Double Point, and Bolinas Lagoon. And yeah, did you mention there's a closure every year uh, in the Bay for uh, recreation, right? Yeah, well, there's the big closure right now because um, we're not going out to those places, but uh, there is a closure to Double Point and to all of the seal colonies. And if you see a seal colony, give them that distance of at least 300 feet. That's a good rule of thumb, if they are reacting, and in contrast to elephant seals, which you can walk quite, quite closely to, with harbor seals, they stampede in the water immediately. So step back and observe without causing their change behavior. But there are closures, and you can go to the park website and see where those closures are. Yes, and according to the Marine Mammal Act, I think it's 300 feet you need to be staying away from the seals. So please adhere to that. Don't just try to walk up to an elephant seal. It may look big and slow, but they're very quick. Um, okay, so I think we have one more question, and then um, we're going to wrap up today. Uh, we have a witch whale question. Surprisingly, there wasn't many whale questions, but I think you covered that really well. Um, you mentioned sperm whales eating Humboldt squid. Do you think there's a correlation when we see the Humboldt squid schools come off Point Reyes with seeing more of those sperm whales? Yes, that's what the NOAA researchers believe is that we're seeing more sperm whales because there are more Humboldt squid occurring 
in our latitude, and that's because the ocean waters are warmer. Um, so Humboldt squid are associated with warmer waters and in warmer and deeper. Uh, so those sperm whales are following them up. But I remember a sperm whale calf 20 plus years ago. So this is an interesting area. It may be that the currents bring them in here, uh, but uh, Point Reyes definitely sees a larger, um, proportionately larger number of sperm whales, live and dead, uh, than we would um, report, say, in other areas along the coast here. Monterey Bay is a different place altogether. It's so deep and attracts an amazing group of animals. And, it, and since this is my last question, I wanted to emphasize, if you want to see whales, get on a boat. It's great at Point Race Headlands. You can see them come in. But if you're on a boat out in the deep ocean, and EAC, EAC has these offshore uh, boat trips, they're terrific. Go to Cordell Bank. Um, you, if you don't up chuck like I do, but I still love it because I love seeing these whales offshore. They're just wonderful. And they come to the boat because the small cetaceans, because they love riding the bow wave. And you get, you, you see amazing wildlife, birds and mammals. So mm -hmm. indulge yourself, get into the deep ocean. Well, thank you, Sarah. I will add to that, having lived at the lighthouse for many years and uh, did interpretation at the lighthouse. I always tell first time people that are looking for whales, um, really uh, coming, the whales going back north are usually your best bet. And sunset seems to be a great time because the spouts get backlit, and especially if you have young children, because it's really hard to describe where you're, uh, to tell a child where to look. But if you come at sunset and you get that sun on the backlight of the, of the spout, and sometimes it's so calm and beautiful out there, you actually hear them breathing when they come up for air and it's pretty amazing so uh again we can't be out there today but you may see whales or other things out there or the gray whale through july i know i've seen them out there passing point rays very closely and then of course throughout the year um you can get a lot of information at point rays national seashore uh, website uh, and so i encourage you to go there to find out rules and regulations and also the best places to see them and then again, uh, join Dr. Sarah Allen and potentially Jenny Stock next year for our 50th anniversary and the Point Reyes Bird Fest in April. And I wanna be uh, say a big shout out to all of our guides. Uh, we have over 40 guides that help us every year put this on. It's really important. They're very knowledgeable and they're very committed to the festival and helping us put that on. And you can learn a lot. Um, and also ethical ways of learning how to learn about nature instead of, uh, you know, making calls and doing things like that. I want to thank our sponsors and attendees for sticking with us during this process. We could not have done this without you. Your support means everything. And if you're not a member yet, as the development director, I would be remiss if I didn't tell you, now is a good time to join if you can, as we know, everybody's going through difficult times right now. But if you think you can make a donation to the cause, please do at eacmarin.org. We thank you for coming today, and we hope to see you guys in the future. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Thank you.